damn late. I had to stop by the Wax Museum again and give the finger to FDR. We know Al-Qaeda, Zawahiri, is supporting the opposition in Syria. Are we supporting Al-Qaeda in Syria? Well, it's a proud day for America. And by God, we've kicked Vietnam Syndrome once and for all. Thank you very, very much. I say it, I say it again. You've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. These witnesses are trying to simply deny things that just about everybody else accepts as fact. He came, he saw, he died. But well, we ain't killing their army, but well, we killing them. We be on CNN like, say our name, Ben, say it, say it three times. The meeting of the largest armies in the history of the world. Then there's going to be an invasion. All right, you guys, on the line, I've got Ken Silverstein. He writes at WashingtonBabylon.com, and he wrote The Secret World of Oil, which I have but have never read, but I should, because what a great title for a book. It sounds interesting. And Private Warriors, about all the American mercenaries and their industry. And here he is, writing at the New Republic of all places. Uh, the title is Why a Coup is Unlikely in Venezuela. Welcome back to the show, Ken. How you doing, man? I'm doing great, Scott. Thanks for having me on. i got to say, before we go any further... I am working on a book about Venezuela, and uh, if your listeners like what they hear, they should check out Washington Babylon, my website, and we're raising money. Uh, we're raising money for a story about Marco Rubio, but that's actually going to be in the book. Uh, a little part will be at our website, um, and and then Counterpunch, which I'm working in collaboration with, is raising money for the book itself. So. Cool. Uh, Anyway, I just have to stress that because you know how hard it is to survive as a journalist these days if you do independent work. Yeah, absolutely, man. I'm all in favor of that, and I'm a big fan of your journalism, too. Uh, I would not be surprised if uh, you got a little bit of help from saying that on this show. I hope so. I, I hope so, too. Thank you. Yeah, man. No problem. Um, well, and you know what? You just need to ring more out of these New Republic guys if you're going to be writing for them. Uh, <laughs> why I'm a doing coup? My best. Uh -huh. It's funny because because they've been bad on every single war since World War One without any exceptions at all, and so you're right. But however, there's a new editor in chief, Chris Lehman, who's a great journalist, a friend. He uh, just took over, um, and so the magazine is about to get a lot better. That's interesting. So his purpose in life is not to sell empire to liberals. De definitely not. His and he got the life, job as editor of the New Republic. You don't say. What an interesting curiosity. Well, I think what happened were there were a few things. The stars lined up. Chris is a great guy. He's a great editor. Um, and the New Republic was in a crisis because it was, um, how shall we say, largely, if not entirely, a piece of crap. Um, I wrote something for them a year or two ago, but it was a boring bad magazine and somebody realized gee maybe we better do something different and bring in somebody smart and interesting who's going to bring in interesting writers um and so they hired chris so it's great news for everybody cool well i'll keep my eyes a little bit wider open for things published there then i like yep. this one i think he did a great job you went down to venezuela and looked at things with your own things with your own eyeballs is that right yeah and it's you know Shocking what one discovers when you go to places that are extensively covered by the U.S. media. I have to say, even I, having been a journalist for, you know, over 30 years and, you know, pretty damn cynical about the American press, um, was sort of shocked. Which, and it takes a lot to shock me. I what? I saw and how widely it diverged with what's been reported. To the extent that I said, the media is either lying or stupid or blind. It's not, it's, it's beyond, <clears throat> the only way to explain it is not, you know, it, it, well, it's lying. I mean, there's, there's just flat out lying going on. Now, why that would surprise me, don't ask. But, um, I'm not saying the situation down there is paradise, but here's something you don't see a lot. We hear about 
how the Venezuelan people are starving and nobody has anything to eat and, you know, the supermarkets are empty. I mean, of course, nobody knows that there are U.S. sanctions that are punishing the population in a way that should be bring international cr- uh, criminal charges against the Trump administration. It's what they did to Iraq before overthrowing Saddam Hussein. They, you know, they starved the population. Then they blamed the government, which is, by the way, has a lot of problems. And I am not a fan of Maduro. It's just that between him and the opposition, I'll take Maduro any day. But they starved the country. They starved the people. They blamed the government, despite the fact that they're not letting any food in and are blocking the sale of oil and trying desperately to produce such a desperate situation. And they've had some success in this, that the population finally says, enough is enough. We're tired. The people there are exhausted. It is a struggle. And they're trying to prompt the military to overthrow the Maduro government. And, you know, they've done, I mean, they do this regularly. When they want a government change, this, this is the strategy. It's what they did in Iraq. Um, you know, who knows what deals they cut. I'm sure they went to some generals and intelligence officials and said, we'll give you a couple of million dollars in an offshore account in a home in Miami and, you know, just, you know, kill Maduro or overthrow him. Um, so, you know, hey, it's a smart strategy, right? I mean, that's the way governments topple. The problem the U.S. is having in Venezuela is, uh, well, there are a few. One is that despite the fact that the people are exhausted, um, they recognize that the opposition is total scum. I'm not saying opposition supporters, because I understand why people are fed up. Maduro is corrupt. Let's not be stupid here. Okay, just because the U.S. says he's corrupt doesn't mean that's all bullshit. He is corrupt. Um, I am a huge fan of Hugo Chavez, his predecessor, who I had the privilege of meeting. I am less a fan of Maduro. Again, though, I want to emphasize, between Maduro corruption and the massive corruption, uh, the criminal corruption, uh, well, let's not say criminal because it's criminal on both sides, but the corruption was worse under regimes previous to Chavez and the socialists uh, who have ruled the country through democratic elections since um 1999, when Chavez first won office, and, you know, his death, with his death, Maduro, the vice president, took over. Anyway, the population knows that the opposition is scum. They experienced for hundreds of years ruled by this white-skinned people over a mostly dark-skinned population. The prior rulers and, and the people like Leopoldo Lopez and Guaido, this Trump's I don't know what language I'm allowed to use on your program. Uh, so let's just call him Trump's trained puppy, um, you know, who, who the U.S. decided was president. Uh, you know, just, well, we don't like Maduro, so we're just going to name our own president for Venezuela. These people are scum. They have no history um, of working for the Venezuelan people. They're rich shitheads. Um, so some of the, you know, I understand why people there are fed up and confused. And Maduro, you know, not just confused. Maduro is not an admirable leader. I would prefer a younger socialist uh, progressive to replace him. That's what I want. I want Maduro out at some point. Um, But the population has been put in a position where they're forced to choose between Maduro and scum of the earth. Um, You know, you read in the U.S. press. I would urge your readers, anybody who doubts me, go to just Google my name with my website, Washington Babylon, and Caracas Chronicles. I wrote a bunch of stories, The New Republic, but also a few stories at Washington Babylon. Um, You know, I took pictures. I went to the poor barrios, the poor neighborhoods. I was, you know, met people because that's what I do. I report. I don't sit around, you know, waiting for the president to talk to me, no matter who the president is, in what country, unless it's Hugo Chavez, who I did wait around for. Um, And I I don't hang out in country clubs and in rich neighborhoods. I spend my time in the barrio when I report from Latin America. And poor people there are not starving. I mean, look, I can only tell you what I saw in many barrios in Caracas. I can't say what's happening outside of Caracas. But the U.S. media portrayal of widespread starvation is a bullshit. I mean, 
I was in the barrios every month. Poor Venezuelans and even lower middle class Venezuelans, because there is a strata that it's not just 99 percent poor and 1 percent scum rich. I mean, there is a middle class and a lower middle class, even lower middle class people get a monthly food box. You know, it's got rice and mayonnaise, which is popular, and uh, corn flour to make arepas and various other items every month. Everybody gets it. And I, I know that true. I mean, I saw it, but I also know many Venezuelans, and they have told me this about their own families. They get a monthly box of food. That's something poor people in this country, like, you know, the poor people in Venezuela get treated with more dignity. You can get on a the metro, which is a pretty good metro system in Caracas, for, like, every, okay, you know, when I say a dime or five cents, that still means something to poor Venezuelans. But, like, I was in Puerto Rico earlier this year. The public transportation is crap. And so you have to drive to your job, even if you're poor or, you know, spend hours on these minibuses. But if you drive, you pay immense toll. I'm writing about this soon, by the way, too, in a, uh, for another publication. Um, and I'd love to talk to you about that when that comes out in a few months. But... Um, in Venezuela, the subways are packed, and it costs, I think it was the equivalent of a dime. So for 20 cents, you can go to your job and, and get back home. I'm not telling you that that's not an expense that's painful, but in most countries, in third world countries I've been to, in Latin American countries, there's no metro system. You know, people get around with much greater difficulty, and they do not get a monthly box of food. So all I can tell you is I went to Barrios. I ate in people's homes. I was fed in a woman's home. I met her at a union meeting, and she said, hey, I want to show you around. The meeting is a little slow, and I want you to see where I live. So we walked for an hour through various poor neighborhoods until we got to her house. She fed me a pile of – and this was food in her house. This was not Potemkin Village stuff. And she's not – I mean, she – you know, I didn't – we never really talked about her views other than I know she's a Chavista pro – Pro Chavez, I don't know what she thinks of Maduro, but I know she prefers the government to the opposition. But she fed me pasta bolognese, she fed me blood sausage, morcita, and and she fed me uh, meat chopped up. It was tripe, which is not my favorite, but it wasn't bad, and it was with a pile of rice. I could barely walk when I left her house, and I bought us a few beers, she and a a friend of hers who had uh, dinner with us. And, you know, that's just... Like, I haven't seen that reported anywhere else in the U.S. media. And that's why if you go to Caracas Chronicles, you'll see that um, I took pictures in the homes of poor people in the barrios and took pictures of the food because I knew people would say that's not true. And I'd say, really? Look at the pictures. If it's not true, then what, did I fake these pictures? Did I make this up? Well, because I was going to say here, let me jump sorry, in here for a I'm second, sorry. Ken. Uh, yeah, be- before my <laughs> audience just decides that you're Walter Durante here, uh, I want to point out, uh, well, speaking of Russia, um, I read a report by a uh, Russian journalist there. Uh, it was really a funny piece. It was at the Sakers blog, and it was about how a cop robbed, uh, the title of it was about how the cop robbed him for his cell phone or something like that. But it, he said, you know, he'd gone all over the place, and he'd gone to the government grocery store where the shelves were stocked. But he said, you know, then again, the government can do that at a loss and whatever, but how's the rest of the economy operating? And he went to uh, and found the regular grocery stores not government owned, but the privately owned grocery stores, and said that all of their shelves were full of stock too, everything that you need, and that all the rumors about everybody going hungry were wrong, just as you're saying, that there was no, essentially, as he put it, there's no state of emergency on the ground there in Caracas at all. Uh, there are protests on one side of town, and there are protests on the other side of town, and but there's no revolution afoot, in, there's no uh, fall of King Louis in the air or any of these kind of things going yeah. on. Although, there but I do want to ask you, though, about prices, yeah. about hyperinflation, not all of which is because of America's economic right. war, but because of the expansion Absolutely. of the monetary base, and also all the people voting with their feet. Apparently, I don't know, I don't know who, who claims what and where these numbers come from, but they say that millions of Venezuelans have fled and just are economic refugees in other Latin American countries and in the United States now. 
Well, there's there's absolutely some truth to that. In fact, I'll tell you, the guy that owns the house I'm renting, he's a Venezuelan who fled just because he couldn't take care of his family because the economy was just garbage. He had to leave. Let me me tell you something, Scott. I lived in Miami for a year and a half because I was, and this is like I'm joking and not joking, an economic refugee. I couldn't get a job in journalism. I got a job in Miami, so I moved there for a year and a half. And I point this out because I met, and yeah, I speak very good Spanish. So I can report from Venezuela and not be led around, which I never was. I was always on my own. Never. And in fact, I got into arguments with government people who did not like what I wrote because I did point out that Maduro is corrupt and authoritarian. And he is far from perfect. And I, he's not my pick for leader of Venezuela. But I, I mean, I met there a ton of, I mean, I can believe the numbers are really high. What they don't mention is that, you know, there are, refugees from Colombia and uh, other Latin American countries all, you know, Venezuela accepted a ton of Colombians for a long time. I mean, but people have voted with their feet. I would say partly because of U.S. strangulation of it. This is not just dating back for months. This is since Chavez took power in 1999. It's just escalated now to a, a point where criminal charges should be brought against Trump, Rubio, John Bolton, and Elliot Abrams for starving the people. I mean, that's, you know, got to be illegal under international law. But we're talking about going back to 1999, not to 2019, January 2019. But, um, but th- there's criticism. Well, there. let, me, let me stop you there just to reiterate, too, because you're kind of going off. But I want to make sure that, you know, people kind of take this point on its own terms and as important as it is. Sanctions is such a soft sort of a euphemism for a blockade, whether a literal one, uh, a real economic embargo, where the purpose of it, the declared purpose of it, is to put pressure on the regime, meaning make the civilian population miserable, i.e. hungrier, sicker, die younger in order to pressure the government or to pressure them into pressuring their government into doing what America wants or ceasing to exist and allowing itself to be replaced by one that the American government would prefer. We call that democracy, but it doesn't look like that to them. And we see them do this over and over again in Iraq, in Cuba, and we're doing it right now in Yemen only with airstrikes and a full naval blockade uh, to go along with it. It doesn't ever work. Uh, it sure makes people miserable and sick and die young, but it never does achieve the regime change. No, it, well, it, it it does. It typically does not, and they and that's that's why you have to be careful. Or I should say, I would be careful. I still believe the coup is not going to succeed, but there's one wild card factor. I mean, Marco Rubio is a lunatic. He's also totally corrupt, which is going to be in the book that I want to, again, mention I'm writing. And if any of your listeners want to contribute, they can go to Counterpunch and check out the book. Uh, This weekend they'll be advertising, uh, showing how to donate to it, or to my site, WashingtonBabylon.com. We have a Patreon to fund this. Um, But, you know, Rubio is off his rocker. Bolton and Elliot Abrams are off their rockers. Um, And Donald Trump. I actually don't think Trump is stupid, and I think it's a mistake to write him off as stupid. He is reckless and dangerous, but he's not dumb. I think he's the best hope, actually, because he's a businessman, and he understands that this might not work out well for business. And also, my understanding is that even oil companies are split. My understanding is that ExxonMobil uh, is way more in the Trump you know, overthrow camp And Chevron is way smarter and are very dubious. Now, I can't state that for certain, but that is what I've heard from very good sources, multiple sources. And so the influence of, you know, uh, there are bondholders of uh, Venezuelan bonds, hedge funds who have a stake here. I mean, it. you know, what I'm trying to get at is you can't say there's not going to be a coup. But I would say there's not going to be an, a change of regime which, without direct U.S. military involvement, like what happened in Iraq, because the sanctions aren't going to work. And the bribing military officers to do what they want is not going to work. The military, it's been under a socialist government since 1999, 
And there's a small clique of officers, not necessarily good. Some of them are decent. Some of them I find very troubling. But who are very, you know, well, A, they're loyal to the revolution, and B, they have a lot to lose because some of them may be corrupt too. And it's a very tightly knit group around Maduro, who really is sort of a puppet and for other people. Um, so that's not going to work. The only thing that will work, I think, is a U.S. invasion. You know, I mean, shit, they just shut down the electric grid, you know, in a lot of if the, if the government had no support, you know, they, they just put out the electric grid. I mean, that was sabotage. Rubio even stupidly said it was sabotage. And then it was like, oh, no, it's because it was obvious who would have done it. He said, no, it wasn't. Um, uh, it was just incompetence on the Venezuelan government. Well, you know, Greg no. Palace said it was because of the sanctions. They need replacement parts, uh, maintenance parts from Siemens in Germany, and the sanctions preclude that. And so just like Iranian That's planes falling point. out of the sky, it's the sanctions and the blockade that, in effect, might as well be the CIA putting a shape charge at the bottom of some tower, right? Yeah, well, that, that's, a, that's actually true. But, I, but I, I think there was, beyond that, I think there was sabotage. And I do think, from what I've heard from people in Venezuela, even government supporters, that, once again, the world is not black and white. There was some incompetence on the part of the government in getting things going. Uh, it wasn't just missing parts and from semen, which I haven't heard about. But from what I've heard, it was not just missing parts. And, you know, it was sabotage. There may have been, uh, you know, amplified by the missing parts. But the government failed to respond in a timely and efficient manner, as it often does. Again, I must emphasize, I don't like the government, but I don't want to see it overthrown. I would like a more progressive socialist to replace Maduro at some point down the road. Um, but I'm not an apologist for the government, but my God, the opposition, they are the worst. I mean, we've seen this play out in other countries. I mean, Gaddafi in Libya was not a nice guy. I mean, you know, his son, you know, his family was pretty brutal. Saddam was not a nice guy. Um, you know, Bashar Assad is not a nice guy. Um, but I think if they overthrow Assad or Maduro, you're, you're going to have worse, way worse than what you had before. Maduro's in a different category. Those other countries are Middle Eastern, and it, that's a different world. I mean, they're tribal societies. Um, I, I visited all. Well, I haven't. I, I haven't Let me ask you this, us. though. I yeah. mean, it doesn't it seem like, and I don't want to make excuses for Trump here at all. But I just thought this anyway before he started making excuses uh, in the Washington Post about it. That Bolton <clears throat> told him this was going to be easy. As soon as this guy declares himself president, the government and the military are going to switch over to him because everybody hates Maduro. But that just wasn't true, or it wasn't true enough. And certainly not with him having the blessing of the Yankee imperialist empire from the north uh, at the time that he declared himself president in January. It didn't work. We already had that, that trombone. They tried the stun at the border uh, with the truck on yeah. fire and all that. That didn't work. Uh, they got Richard Branson, of all people, Richard in on that one. And then they failed again two weeks ago. He announced himself president again and asked the military to rally around him, and all of that fell flat. So that's already over. And I just got to say, going from my gut, that it doesn't seem like the next plan is to send Jay Sock to murder him or to invade with the Marines. I, you're right. That's what it would take. But that's what Trump doesn't yeah. want to do that, does he? He's not going to do I, that. I, I Look, I don't think so. I, but it's and the Marines and the Army got to be telling him, man, we don't want to no do way. that. And it will be <laughs> you know, come on. No, no, no. I, look, I'm saying, but, but, but one never knows. when. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure, Scott, you're familiar with the term cakewalk, which, which is what they predicted in Iraq. Which Yeah, Ken yeah, Edelman. Which, yeah, exactly. And, yeah, sure, it was a cakewalk uh, overthrowing Saddam, and then things went to shit from there. But I think you're right. There's no question these morons and criminals, Bolton, Abrams, and Rubio, told him this is going to be a piece of cake. This regime is going to topple, like, like you know, we're, it's going to go down like dominoes going to be a cakewalk. And Trump, I admit what I can't figure out, because Trump is not stupid, that's the thing that people have to be careful of. Um, he, he, I don't like the guy. Um, I didn't vote for him. I didn't vote at all, because to participate in that shit show election was just too degrading for me. I mean, there's a limit to my masochism, so I just sat it out. But, um, you know, but he's not stupid. 
What I can't quite figure out is, you know, how he's allowing, you know, how did the neocons infiltrate his administration? Not only in Venezuela. I mean, it's, it's, it's a problem across the board. You know, you've got clowns. That Rubio is too stupid to read off a teleprompter. I mean, Bolton and, and, and Abrams should be rotting in prison cells. I mean, we are talking about the three stooges here. So how do these guys, how did the neocons, I mean, we do know, you know, everybody hates to use the term deep state. You can call it whatever you want, but there is a foreign policy elite, a group of mandarins that are very, very, very hard to dislodge. And neocons are very, very powerful. It's not, it's, it's not unilateral. I mean, there are opposing forces. But you know, it really is interesting in this case, isn't it, how and this is a pretty small sort of slice of that foreign policy blob that really mm-hmm. is about this. It has so much to do with like making sure to win Florida next time and these right. kind of politics. This isn't the argument of the Council on Foreign Relations Journal and foreignpolicy.com and all of the more centrist think tanks. However... As soon as Donald Trump and John Bolton and Elliot Abrams and Marco Rubio announce that this is what they're doing, the entire American media establishment, the entire center rallies around it as uh, fairness and accuracy in reporting um, presented in their study. Zero percent of major American media figures, including the editorial page of every single newspaper in this country and all of the uh, cable television talk show hosts and stars, et cetera, were opposed to this. In fact, the one exception they left out was Tucker Carlson Tucker Carl- on Fox I mean, News. <clears throat> unbelievable. No, it's, it's astonishing, and it's sad and depressing, and it makes me, you know, I increasingly, I've, I've toyed with uh, getting out of journalism uh, many, many times. Uh, unfortunately, it's the only thing I know how to do. However, I, you know, I have to supplement my income in various ways because journalism pays shit. And because, you know, I've worked at places like the Los Angeles Times, Vice, Harper's Magazine. I mean, the LA Times, I guess, would be the most surprising. I had a really cool editor who said, you know, you're, you're a great investigator. She put me on the National Investigative Unit. And then I quit over in the dispute four years later, uh, after having gone through multiple problems there. I quit in a dispute about the way they edited a story of mine on the Middle East, where they wouldn't allow me to say that Israel had stolen Palestinian land, which is just a fact, but that couldn't be printed in the New York, in the LA Times. In any case, it's a very sad state of affairs. But what you're what you're pointing to is the way that, you know, there's that saying our divisions end at the water's edge, you know, like so Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives, one, you know, it's wag the dog. We're, you know, that's the, what, and frequently it succeeds. There are a lot of stupid people in this country. I hate to say it. There are a lot of smart people. And I, I'm actually optimistic in some ways, not about journalism. Journalism is dead. I mean, you know, I'm still doing it because I'm stupid, but I'm optimistic about our future and which is really rare for me. Um, but I think people are getting smarter and smarter. You know, the wag the dog stuff doesn't work as effectively as it used to. And other than the media, which is, you know, privileged, wealthy, elitist, Ivy League schools, upper class schools for the most part. I mean, when you get to the top of journalism, you're looking at country club lifestyle. I mean, these clueless boobs don't even recognize they either are too stupid or corrupt. To recognize what's going on right in front of their faces, which is that for most people in this country, they are hurting. I mean, this country is, you drive, look, I live in a nice neighborhood in Washington, D.C. You know, it's a middle class neighborhood. It is not an upper middle class neighborhood. It is, I love it. I love being here because it's African American, it's Caribbean, it's Ethiopian. And so I don't have to deal with official asshole Washington, D.C. I barely interact with it. I mean, I don't need to. I've been here a long time. I'm thinking of leaving the country, frankly. I have for a long time, but... I couldn't live within a thousand miles of Washington, D.C. I don't know how you do it. I do it because I've got a piece up at Washington Washington Babylon that's posting at 2 o'clock about recently traveling to Ethiopia. I travel a lot, and when I'm in my neighborhood, I, I hang out with 
he, he, I don't hang out with the asshole DC. So I spend a lot of time at a great Ethiopian shisha bar. I hang out with people I like. I'm I'm like three miles. I'm in DC, but I'm not in official DC, and I don't interact with official DC. Even though there are, you know, I, of course, I have friends in that world and sources in that world, and people who I respect and admire. But for the most part, I don't really interact with it. That's how I survive here. Well, Otherwise, and the point is too. Rock. The the more important point I think, Ken, is that. People like them don't interact with people like you or your neighbors <laughs> or any of the rest of us either. Man, all and these CNN ladies telling each other how smart they are all day, they don't know nothing at all. Well, you've, you've nailed it, and that's where I was heading. But I, I frequently, as you can tell, I get excited and distracted and lose my train of thought. That's nah, all right, man. Trying... Believe me, I do it every day. <laughs> you know, what I was trying to say is just that if you drive 30 minutes, I mean, if you drive 10 minutes from my house, I mean, if you drive five minutes, if you walk five minutes, you see a lot of abandoned houses. I mean, it's a nice, you know, middle class neighborhood for the most part. Um, but, you know, if you drive 20 minutes, you see real poverty. If you drive 40 minutes out into Maryland uh, or, or parts of Virginia, I mean, you see it's all over there. But these assholes sit around on their expense account at downtown Washington, D.C., expensive restaurants and tell each other how great they are. They don't have a clue what's going on in the country. They're idiots are corrupt. I mean, I don't know, Scott. It's one of the great mysteries. Noam Chomsky posed the question many years ago, um, you know, when writing so many great things, manufacturing consent with Ed Herman. I think he wrote that one with Herman. I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But in any case, I mean, it's a lifelong mystery. Are these people stupid? Or are they corrupt? I mean, it's, you know. Definitely it's, both. Yeah, definitely both. Yeah. So. And and this is one of the things that it's kind of fascinating to me. I, I think I figured out, it must have been 2008 or something, I started, uh, you know, and I don't want to pick a fight with everybody, really. But I do think that essentially everybody is a truther. That everybody argues inductively about everything. Everybody believes whatever the hell they want, and everybody hates whoever they feel like, and they don't have to change their mind ever, you know? And people live in a complete other world. I mean, the world where Donald Trump is a secret Russian spy is the same world where Barack Obama is a secret Kenyan Muslim. And the same world where Absolutely. we're going to what we're going to do is we're going to send the Marine Corps to Fallujah to make these people free or whatever it is. And you want, you know, people um all day long, I'll tell you one where and I don't have a dog in this fight and I'm not fighting about it, but it, the point is about the meta point about the fight is every day in media are doctors and more elite media people just savaging people who don't believe in vaccines. But they never ask the question of why don't you trust me, man? I'm a scientist. I'm telling you. But people go, uh uh. And they don't trust it. Why not? It's because they know that everything is corrupt. They know that everybody's incentive is not what it's supposed to be. And that if you would make money selling me a vaccine full of poison, you would. And if the same people who told me that the moon orbits the earth are the same people who told me we had to go save the world from Saddam Hussein, then why should I believe anything that they say at all? And that's where people are now. They're lost in the dark. But why? Because all their elitist leaders who are in charge of everything are so corrupt and so dishonest that nobody knows anything to believe in anymore. So then any jackass with conviction, whether John Bolton or some, you know, kook in the media or whoever it is who says this is the way it is, people glom right onto it. Rachel Maddow is a great example. Matt Taibbi's right. new book has Maddow and Hannity is one one and the same people running the charade on on everyone else, you know? Right. I agree with you. I totally agree with you, and it makes it very hard to assess any information because there is so much, I hate to use the term because it's a Trump term, there's so much fake news. But there is fake news, and that's why Trump gets traction with that, because people don't trust the media. But that, and I have to bring this to a close, I think I've probably gone on too long, but i got to run. I hate to do this to you. And we're way off Venezuela, but I'm having fun talking with you. But I do just, I do, sorry, I do just want to say I am optimistic because because people are fed up, because people no longer believe the lies. You know, Donald Trump is, is, is not the cause 
of the uh, problems facing this country. He's a symptom. Uh, people were desperate. You know, Bernie was blocked, and Trump was became the only option to the old order, the corrupt old right. order of Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. So that's, I think, why Trump got elected. I mean, to, you know, to sum up in... Absolutely. Seconds, I mean, in fact, either. look, you couldn't have written it as a TV show script any other way. We were told years in advance that our choice was going to be either Bill Clinton's wife or George Bush's brother. And that was going to be it. We already knew it is preordained. Right. And the fact that Trump saw the hole in the market there, that he could probably maybe beat them both if if the both was what he was running against. That was smart. It only took Roger Stone to figure it out. You know, nobody too bright. Exactly. Exactly. And so but people are fed up. And I think the uh, our leaders are in for a very, very rude shot. I don't know how it's going to play out, but the political system is rigged to the point that it's virtually impossible to do anything. I mean, except you do end up with people like AOC, who I still, you know, have some issues with. But, I mean, let's face it, if her or Joe Crowley, I'll take AOC. I really admire Omar, Representative Omar. There are people getting in who are better. I think it's going to end up with a lot of uh, bricks being thrown uh, through store windows. I mean, yeah. I think we're in such a state. Yeah, I'm not urging that. Although I would say that if it comes to that, I will be throwing bricks. Yeah. Um, well, one more thing. I one more thing I want to throw in here because this yeah. keeps coming up, and so many of my friends and interviewees are leftists. But you know, I'm a libertarian, and I think it's really important are. for people, from my point of view, to to listen closely to what is going on around here, where people are moving so much further to the left and further to the right because the centrist neo liberals have absolutely failed. But for us libertarians, this ought to be our place in the market to say, no, freedom is what we all have in common, and freedom, if if limiting power and enhancing individual liberty is for everyone is our political ideal then that should be the real moderate center that we can all uh, all support rather than kind of neoliberalism which is really sort of third way fascism right just democratic fascism in a sense this corrupt empire we have now so no wonder everyone hates it but it's a real crisis of which way we're going to go now and you know, you say you like AOC, but just as much as you like her, there's a lot of people reacting so harshly the opposite direction where it's almost it's the symptom of the same thing, you know, where everybody needs to stop reacting and start, you know, thinking and and uh, and compromising about some of this stuff and not in a John McCain, Absolutely. Hillary Clinton way, but in more of a Ron Paul way. Like, hey, I'll stop doing in this if you'll a, stop doing that. If I can say in more of a Ken Silverstein, Scott Horton way. Because you and I don't agree on everything, but we recognize that the country is in a crisis. We want a better country. You know, we're not in the power to do much because we're, you know, voices pissing in the wind sometimes is what it feels like. But I do feel like we have a bigger audience, people like you and I. And you and I aren't going to agree on everything, but we respect each other's opinions and we're willing to engage and to talk and to have an intelligent conversation. And not to scream and shout like those idiots, Rachel Maddow and Sean Hannity. Yeah, and there's so many good right wingers too. I mean, if you read Daniel Larison and all the guys over at the American Conservative Magazine, I read lots of. I, I, mean, I read lots of conservatives. Yeah, I read lot. I'm on the left, but some. Hey, it's like they say about you know. I always used to hear when I was a kid. Some of my best friends are Jews. That's what Jew haters would always say. Um, you know, hey, some of my best friends are conservatives, and that's the truth. I mean, I I I find it, you know. I don't want to be in a in in a bubble, whether it's a Hannity bubble or a Wolf Blitzer bubble or a Rachel Maddow bubble. I like my ideas to be challenged. It's like playing tennis, Scott. If you play with people inferior to you, who or who people who play at your level, you get worse, or you just stay the same. I want to get smarter. Yeah. I want to hear opposing points of view. It's what makes life interesting. Right. So, one more thing on sports there, too, is if you've ever played any sport, then you know of people of all different descriptions from you who are better than you. And so you have to respect that. Simple as That's that. Right. There's every kind of human in the world. You can find at least many of them who are better than me at skateboarding. And that is the real measure of a man, is it not? <laughs> so um, and once you realize that, you know, the people who are better people than you disagree with you, then that's a, a, a new beginning of wisdom, too. You're right. Anyway. Yeah, All right. Hey, love talking to you. Thanks, Ken.
Hey, thank you so much. All right, guys, check out Ken Silverstein. He's at Washington Babylon. Like he said, he's got a new book project. You can read about that at Counterpunch also. Um, And check out this great article at the New Republic, Why a Coup is Unlikely in Venezuela. It's uh, from back on March 5th, 2019. All right, y'all, thanks. Find me at libertarianinstitute.org, at scotthorton.org, antiwar.com, and reddit.com slash Show. Oh, yeah, and read my book, Fool's Errand, Timed and the War in Afghanistan, at foolserrand.us.